there have been some success stories. Success stories like take for example Columbia River where both uh, United States and Canada have come together. They have given the uh, possibilities of uh, uh, the, the technocrats or the water experts, environmentalists, the professionals to take care of this man. So if there is a challenge, then the professionals can take it over. I mean, maybe US, Canada are, are two developed, uh, rich democratic countries, but like take for example, uh, in Senegal River, Senegal and Mauritania, they have come together. We have seen that the countries are coming together uh, to do this and give it to the professionals to take care of this water management. Uh, we have also seen Danube, there has been a huge success story in the Danube because of the European Water Framework Directive that the countries, because Danube Basin is a combination of very uh, democratic, industrial, rich countries in the in the upstream, whereas very poor, ethnically divided, very challenging countries in the south. I mean, the, or in the in the southern part of the basin. So we we do see there is a there is a combination of uh, uh, countries which makes it much more challenging how you do it. So I think Danube is a, also a very success story, but the will can can we take these success stories and take it to other uh, basins. That's what I was saying, there is no golden principle. Because take for example, uh, I give this example like in the Rhine Basin. In the Rhine Basin there was a conflict, conflict in the 1970s that the potassium mining which was then taking in the, in the Alsace region in France uh, was uh, uh, emitting salt into the water. So the Netherlands and the Germans were complaining about it because the salt water was coming. So then they finally signed an agreement. As for the agreement, not only uh, um, France paid, also Germany paid, and the, the last pol the receiver of the pollution, that's Netherlands, paid more than even France and Germany. So 34% of the money uh, for Netherlands paid, 30% Germany paid, 30% France paid, but the so most important thing is 6% was paid by uh, Switzerland which has nothing to do with the pollution or by pollution control measure, it's not going to get benefit because it's upstream. But the Switzerland had the resources and it wanted to be a big, uh, nice neighbor. But imagine if India is polluting, Bangladesh is complaining and they want to find out a measure that, uh, that will Indians will able to control the pollution in the Ganges River at the Indian side, how much you expect the Nepal to contribute to come on and so on. That's the challenge. So we can't really take the Nile, sorry, Rhine issue and put it the Ganges issue or the, in the Nile issue. If you take, for example, in the Nile, people go back to the 5,000 years of history that they said that Egypt will say that we have been using this water for 5,000 years. You take the Ganges thing, then the Indians will say this water has been given by Hindu God, Bangladesh is a Muslim country. So, you know, and you go to the Jordan River, Israelis and the Jordanians and Lebanese will have a different story to tell. So, so there is a different cultural, historical, uh, geographical, uh, civilizational uh, challenges which exist in the different basins. So there is, uh, that's why I said there is no golden principles. But of course there are success stories. Uh, there, there is a certain aspects of uh, 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 what you call it urgency in the people's understanding of this transboundary water management. Uh, if you know that there have been uh, this, uh, as I was take, talking about the UN Convention on the Non-Navigational Use of International Water Courses, which has been there for the peop countries to ratify, and the basic ra minimum ratification was taking many, many years. It has become uh, much more pr faster, and then people have ratified, and you know, uh, last year it has come into um, uh, in force. Uh, but then there have been different organizations are taking the interest that the climate change is creating these challenges for the transboundary water. The international community has, is gradually realizing that the business as usual, we cannot go on, we need to um, tell the parties, tell the work, you know, countries with whom we are working together. Uh, but these are all coming from the very disparate way. There is no such what you call it, uh, uh, there have been several 
um, ways that we want to bring together all the parties. There has been UN water, uh, but I think we, even the international actors do have their own countries of uh, interest, their own constituencies, so they want to play their own role. Everyone understands the challenges, but to coming together for finding a common policy framework hasn't yet. But I think it's a gradual understanding has come in that we cannot uh, go on as usual at, on the transboundary water management. The climate change has to be addressed in a much stronger way. And that needs uh, most of the countries, or if not to all of the countries, to come together to doing this.